do a quick turnaround. Like I said, um, so I'm going to introduce Suzanne on my right. Uh, you've already uh, met Suzanne for your previous question. And I think some of the issues regarding the media were already introduced, actually, by the last panel that we and our students have spent a good bit of time talking about the media. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating and I think quite unsettled, so it's an interesting topic for us. Anyway, this panel will be moderated by uh, Suzanne Kelly on my right. This is our first opportunity to meet Suzanne, although I'll confess up front, I'm a uh, regular reader uh, of the Cypher Brief. She is the editor, publisher, founder, <coughs> owner, principal, um, and chief bottle washer uh, at the Cypher Brief. And it's really fast, I, I do recommend it to you. It's a fascinating uh, glimpse. She has a terrific uh, set of relationships and uh, there's something interesting on there almost every day. And many of us who worked in the CIA in the, in the operations directorate or the clandestine service, we gravitate towards her segment called the dead drop, which is fascinating. <laughs> it, a little bit gossipy, but um, nobody loves gossip like case officers. Um, in any event, so Suzanne has a, has a, a great, um, a great uh, career in journalism. Prior to that, she was uh, CNN's uh, intelligence correspondent, the co-editor and co-founder of uh, CNN's national security website. She's worked as a war correspondent. She's authored a book. Uh, and we're just delighted to have her uh, as part of our family and moderating this panel. So I'll turn thank it over you. to you. Thank Thanks. you. It's a very kind. Thank you very much for um, asking me to do this, Steve. And Admiral Inman, thank you. And this is a fantastic program. And I'm very happy to hear that the subject of intelligence is being taken more seriously at this level with the education and the enthusiasm um, and interest of the young people we just heard from. So thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of it. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, we've heard some amazing things today um, that all intersect in one way or another. And I think getting a complete picture of what we face in the future relies heavily on understanding those intersections. Um, we heard Lisa Monaco say that there is an essential role for a responsible media to investigate. So that's one of the things we're going to talk about this afternoon. Um, I'm also not afraid to bring up some controversial issues, so I hope to get your hearts revving just a little bit with this last panel of the day and get, um, invite you to um, go ahead and contribute as much as, you, as you'd like to. And um, Congressman Conway, I've, I've got some ideas for you ahead in terms of questions. So. <laughs> um, I, I, I will start this out by um, making a couple of statements. One is, um, the media has an incredible power to set the agenda. I have seen this over my 20 plus year career as a journalist. I have been in war zones where I've been trying to file reports back to the states to let people understand what's going on in regions where stories have gotten pushed off the air for things like a runaway bride and a cruise ship that's been out of gas for five days, right? Which is the most painful live picture to ever sit on. Um, but the media sets the agenda, it shapes the perception, um, and it's a media that often uh, uses anonymous sources. So it's almost as good as turning to uh, a friend and having them give you some sexy headline where there's no proof, no background, but it sounds good, so let's go with it. Um, there's also sort of an old school, more responsible media that I think is uh, feeling some frustration of the new media. Um, the digital, the speed at which this digital information comes up, um, and the lack of vetting of sourcing on this. Um, and it leads to a public that doesn't ask difficult questions anymore because they hear it, it must be true. Uh, I think that happens more often than not. So I hope I haven't uh, insulted half the people in this room, but um, we're gonna start there. So we have a great panel to talk about this. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky to be sharing this, this uh, table with them today. Um, John Walcott, um, and I'm not going to read the full bios either, but you all should if you haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. 
Um, John Walcott is going to return to active duty next week. I like that, as the international editor um, in the Washington Bureau of Reuters. Um, Reuters is one of those news agencies like the Associated Press that helps set the agenda on what gets covered because a lot of other publications pick up those stories and run with them. So he will have incredible reach and an incredible ability to help shape the agenda. Um, he also is uh, the Knight Ritter, he was formerly the Knight Ritter Washington Bureau. Under his leadership, he won widespread acclaim for its early critical coverage of the Bush administration's allegations that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and ties to international terrorism is also the subject of a forthcoming movie that's being produced and directed by Rob Reiner. So that's that little bit of dead drop gossip that's interesting that, that we can ask him about later. Uh, to his left is Eric Schmidt. Um, Eric and I have worked together as colleagues um, previously. I've known him for a number of years. We've sat in some briefings together. Um, Eric is probably one of the best journalists that I've seen in my time um, covering this, the community. Um, national security and intelligence. He is a senior writer who covers terrorism and national security for the New York Times. He is the co-author with the Times' Tom Shanker of a book called Counter-Strike. It's the untold story of America's campaign against Al-Qaeda. Also, no small thing, um, he shared a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. So I think um, I'm very interested to hear a lot of uh, what I try to put you on the hot seat for today, too. Um, and then to my right is Bill Harlow. He is um, a writer and a consultant and a public relations specialist. Before that, he had quite a storied career as a spokesman at the intelligence agency we all know as the CIA, um, where I think you were the second longest holding person who Seven was able years. to take it without um, having a severe drinking problem or... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jury's out on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, also did the same role at the White House for a period of time. So he's sort of been that gatekeeper of information we talk about when the media starts calling and demanding answers to things. What can we tell them? What should we tell them? And what shouldn't we? Um, he is the author of three New York Times bestselling books on the CIA. You all may have heard about The Center of the Storm, written by a man called George Tennant. Um, Hard Measures by Jose Rodriguez that was published in 2012 talked about a lot of those. Um, methods of interrogation that were used, um, and The Great War of Our Time, um, just published last year with the former acting director, Michael Morrell. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here. A uh, couple of things we're going to kind of group this, because I'm a bucket thinker. Um, talk about two things. One, how do you handle scoops involving classified information or operations? I think that's sort of that very sexy Jack Bauer 24 like ticking time bomb. You have information, it's really interesting, it's a sexy headline. People could get killed if you report it, right? It's a reality, it happens, I don't wanna say every day, but it happens pretty regularly, would you agree? Um, and then the other, is the media still a trusted source? And how do we know who is and who isn't, and why should we care? So let's tackle that, and if we could start each of you has a very unique story on um, the scoop issue. You've all had um, experience from both sides. And Bill, it's great having you up here, too, because you kind of get both sides of the story. Why don't we start with you? You had two stories we talked about previously that I'd like you to kind of touch on and explain. One was involving Iran's nuclear documents um, and a 1985 hijacking um, that you all, well, some of you in this room will remember and some of you won't. Um, there were Navy SEALs on the plane, and one of them was killed. And uh, we didn't know, we being the, the US government at the time, didn't know whether the terrorists knew they had more Navy SEALs on that flight. So both of those are wonderful. Can you touch on both of those and yeah, how you handled I'll them? Try to quickly. Uh, the, the, I'll start with the hijacking. That was in 1985. Uh, a TWA Flight 847 was hijacked in the Mediterranean, was flown around from stop to stop. At one stop, they shot and killed a Navy diver. Robert Steedham threw his body out onto the tarmac. And then the hijacking continued on. Uh, I was a Pentagon spokesman at the time. We knew that there were seven or eight other Navy divers on that flight in civilian clothes. We didn't know whether the hijackers knew they were uh, military personnel or not, but there was a possibility, and we were concerned that if they learned that they were military, they would be the next people to be killed, and we wanted to try to prevent that. What I ended up doing was going down to see the Pentagon's uh, correspondents, all the major networks and, and news organizations in the Pentagon at the time, and I told them that there were other Navy people on board, and I said, but your colleagues have agreed not to report it. Now, the first time I said that it was kind of stretching the truth, but, uh, but it, it became true as the more I said it. Uh, and I, I said to them, you know, and so uh, we don't want you to report that. We don't know that if the hijackers know these, these people are, are sailors or not. 
but you don't want to be the one responsible for their deaths by reporting it. And everyone agreed to do that as long as their competitors held, held and, and the story did hold it, that information did not get out. I would tell you that that would be really hard to do today because it wouldn't be just going down to see a half dozen Pentagon correspondents. It would be having to deal with all the internet organizations out there. Somebody would report it in some obscure location and they, the, inter, the competitive pressure would be such that people would feel an obligation that they have to report it and that information would get back to the airplane quicker than, than uh, anything. So that was something we could do back in, in the day uh, that, that uh, was unable, you know, I think we were unable to pull off. The other story that Suzanne mentioned, somewhat more than a little controversial one, involves one of uh, Eric's uh, colleagues, uh, Jim Risen from the New York Times, uh, contacted us at CIA, said he had been told a story about how the CIA had slipped some flawed uh, documents on nuclear weapons design to the Iranians, and he was going to write a story about it. I didn't know about the specifics of it, but I said, well, there's two possibilities. Your story is right, and you shouldn't write it, or your story is wrong, and you shouldn't write it. <laughs> but, you know, this is very dangerous stuff. You know, we, we do try to prevent countries from building nuclear weapons, and, and however you got this information, it wouldn't be a good thing. He said, well, I'm going to have to raise it with my bosses, and it will take more than you, Harlow, to convince us not to run this, because it's a good story. So I raised it with my bosses, and it ended up with a, a meeting in the White House in Condi Rice's office with the CIA director, the number two guy in the clandestine service, me, uh, Risen, and, and the senior people from the New York Times. They laid out the case of why it was, they thought, a bad thing to uh, do this uh, story, and the New York Times agreed and did not report it for a long time after that. Sometime after that, Jim Risen had a, had a book to come out, and he had some, I guess he had some space he had to fill in, so he put that story in his book. I'm told, he subsequently told his bosses after it went to the publisher that, oh, by the way, I put that story in my book. They suddenly decided that, yeah, it was newsworthy and they had done additional research and so they put the story, or they eventually put the story in the Times, so they delayed it a little bit. That story goes on forever. Uh, later, it was determined that there was a CIA, a former CIA officer who was the probable source for that uh, leak to Ryzen and he ended up uh, in court and is now uh, in prison for having done so. And there was a big debate over whether Risen should have been forced to testify or not. In the end, he wasn't. I think that was the right decision. I think it's, it's, a, it's the responsibility of the government to police its own people, prevent them from leaking classified information, uh, but not to go after the media, which is a bridge too far. Yeah, thank you. So save up your questions, because I want to quickly, we've got a couple of other interesting examples as well. Um, John, you were, um, you were called up one day um, and given sort of exact details of the numbers of KGB officers in certain locations around the world. And if I'm setting this up correctly, when somebody calls you um, as a journalist and gives you a bit of information like that, if it's a trusted source, you know that it's important, but you don't really understand the context. Is that right? And tell us what you did. Yeah, that happens fairly frequently. In this case, it was unusually specific. It had to do with a number of KGB officers, additional KB, KGB officers assigned to Vienna and Mexico City. And the numbers were exact, and I had no reason to think they were wrong. But I've covered this stuff for 35 years, and I have never fancied myself an intelligence expert. Uh, I've not had the benefit of graduate school in Williamsburg, uh, which Steve probably remembers well. Uh, so what I did is something that's very hard to do today. I didn't go to the public affairs office. I went to someone I had known and trusted for some time. We'd have an existing relationship who was an expert in these matters. And I asked him what would happen if I published these numbers. And he said, well, two things would happen. First of all, the Russians would know that we knew. And they would start asking, how did they know? They'd have their own leak investigation mm -hmm. going. Uh, not a good thing. Second, he argued that they would know how many additional officers we would have to assign to keep track of their additional officers which had the benefit of giving me a graduate course in counter-surveillance, which 
has proved useful in other endeavors. Uh, store windows, cell phones, all that stuff. Uh, and third, he argued, what difference does it make to the American public if the Soviets added three officers in Vienna or six? It doesn't matter. So I digested all of that, and the numbers never appeared in the Wall Street Journal, where I worked at that time. And I've tried to do that, and, and I just finished with a thought that's come up again and again. Congressman Conaway brought it up. The student panel brought it up. The necessary trust between members of the media and members not only of the intelligence community but on the Hill and in the White House has deteriorated to such a point that those conversations are almost impossible to have. And I think some way, somehow, we have to find a way to rebuild that trust, which often takes, you know, it can take 10, 20 years. Uh, and it's often it's based on what you don't write rather than what you do write. Uh, but I think until we get to a point where those kinds of conversations can be had, uh, it's going to be very hard to be as responsible as I think we in the media need to be uh, in reporting, particularly on these clandestine activities. Thank you. Um, Eric, I haven't really prepped you for this, so um, don't kill me, but you have um, you've spent time recently focused on ISIS, and you spent some time with um, some military trainers um, who were working um, to help kind of prevent, I guess, the spread, or I'm not sure if they were targeting what they were doing. But give us a sense real quickly of what you were doing. And secondly, of um, how you handle when you're working that closely, you're actually out there in the field with guys who are doing training. You're not sitting in a nice, cushy office in New York. Um, how do you handle it when information gets out there that maybe you shouldn't have heard, um, and someone comes to you afterwards and says, you know what, that was classified. Can you keep that a secret? So, so you're refer referring to my uh, most recent travel overseas. I was embedded with some U.S. Army Special Forces, uh, Third Group Special Forces in Senegal. And what the U.S. does every year in that part of West Africa is hold a training exercise uh, involving Green Berets and their equivalents in about a dozen other African militaries. And this is in part, to, in part some basic training skills, how do you defeat an ambush, some, some marksmanship and those kind of things. But it's also a way of bringing together these, uh, these, these new, new armies that African nations are building, often with the U.S.'s help, uh, the help from the military, from the State Department, from intelligence communities, and their, uh, so they talk with each other, so they cooperate with each other. And in this part of Africa, there, there often hasn't been that type of cooperation, so that when you have a threat that comes up, like the Al-Qaeda branch in the Maghreb, or Boko Haram in Nigeria, it's not just one of these countries fighting it. It's, they're trying to work together. But this is a very new concept. And so when I go and I'm, I'm, I'm in, embedded essentially with these, uh, with these troops, uh, and sometimes it's you're, you're in a hotel and you go out for the day, uh, as I did this time. Otherwise, otherwise you're, on, you're in tents, uh, basically. And you're, you're basically part of this unit. And granted, this is a training exercise. Uh, but what you're listening to is that conversation that's going back and forth between established uh, U.S. forces and their counterparts. And what's interesting to hear is not only are the African forces perhaps learning new techniques and procedures uh, from their more experienced American counterparts, many of whom have served multiple tours in places like Iraq and in Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen. Uh, but they're learning as well from their African counterparts. The, the very important part about the individual skills that these, uh, these troops, who maybe don't have the technical proficiency of American forces, but they know the language, they know the culture, that you can, so that when they're paired up in an actual operation, they'll be much more effective than the best trained Green Beret because they'll have that cultural sensitivity, they'll know the nuance in a certain dialect, they'll be able to detect something that's a little bit off if they come across somebody. And these are very important skills, and I was a little bit surprised to learn of this kind of two-way street. It made sense, of course, uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with the Americans trying to improve the capability of these uh, African forces on the ground, because of course that is one of the, uh, one of the main principles of kind of the emerging uh, counterterrorism strategy of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Obama administration is to try and have more indigenous forces take on responsibility 
uh, for their security. So the U.S. does not have to send in tens of thousands of troops in major conflicts like we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so, so there is this learning process going on. And, and as, I, as I sit in on these, these situations, uh, I am allowed to listen to oftentimes classified intelligence briefs. And there's an understanding that that's not something I'm going to write about. I will, I will learn about what not only the American briefers, but Nigerian briefers or Chadian briefers uh, know about their enemy, whether it's, uh, whether it's the existing force, Boko Haram in northeast Nigeria, whether it's AQIM, or what I learned more about on my most recent trip was the growing threat of ISIS in Libya and how uh, ISIS is reaching out through social media to attract young people <coughs> in as far away as Senegal, a West African country that's really been immune to that, kind of that, that terrorist pull and that jihadi uh, narrative up to this point. So I, I can sit into these briefings, I can listen, but I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not going to put into the pages of the New York Times the very descriptive details, the kind of very detailed numbers that John just mentioned about uh, what the actual you know, strength of, the suspected strength of Boko Haram in this particular place is. Uh, because they, they'll read the website as well, and if they read, uh, this is exactly what you know, the U.S. intelligence believes their strength is. They know, as John said, that there's a leak in their operation or that they need to change in doing that. But what it does for me and that I can impart to my readers is a sense of trends, of a growing threat in a particular place. Uh, in this case, it's the, con it, it, it's the convergence of threats. Some of it have been there for a few years. Boko Haram has been around for a long time. It's only really gotten a, a notoriety since they, they kidnapped the 300 Chibok girls. Uh, but you have that, you have Al-Qaeda, and now the newest threat, of course, is ISIS. And how many of these countries in West Africa, very impoverished, huge places, country like Niger, for instance, uh, whose, whose president and whose security forces are stretched thin on borders they cannot patrol on their own, are trying to do the right thing, uh, and with American assistance and other assistance, particularly from the French in that part, of the world are trying to combat a growing uh, terrorist threat here. Um, this is an important message to get out to our readers and to people understand who maybe are only focused on Iraq and Afghanistan or maybe have tuned out altogether because the American public is just sick and tired of, of, of nearly 15 years of war, but that there is a growing threat uh, from ISIS brewing in this part of Africa, a continent that frankly most Americans don't pay a whole lot of attention to and they should. So it's valuable for reporters like me who are based in Washington to get out in the field. I make at least three foreign trips a year, one to, to Africa, uh, one to the Middle East where I can check in with my Middle East sources, particularly in the Gulf, <coughs> find out what's going on there. And then in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Europe. Uh, part of my beat is also watching the, uh, the resurgent Russian threat and, and going to places like the Baltics and trying to understand a little bit better uh, their, their sense of the Russian bear and where that's coming from in the, in the, the kind of the new and repeated themes of Cold War powers coming up again and trying to watch that is, uh, is the same time, of course, uh, we're kind of watching the terrorism stuff, much of what we've talked about today. Uh, there are other major uh, kind of state-sponsored issues that we need to address as well. So it, it's, an, it's an important part of my beat that I'm balancing uh, that what I believe is the readers need to know and right to know. Uh, and essentially we'll try and be publishing as much as I can, uh, but working with government sources to understand what are the sensitivities, what would be the lines that are crossed that could A, jeopardize American lives, B, uh, imperil sources and methods that allow U.S. and allied forces to combat terrorists, uh, and then broader national security issues as well. Uh, is, this, is this government, the American government, it works with its, uh, its allies to fight an increasingly complex and fast-moving uh, stream of threats around the world. So I think you've just heard three really interesting different perspectives on the trust issue. And when you're asking yourself, can the media be trusted, I want you to keep these three things that you've just heard in mind. I'm going to tell you a couple more things, and then I'm going to ask you all to participate for a second. So um, personal experiences I've had, um, I have gone on to report something where I was asked by an anchor um, repeatedly if something else was true because they read it on a blog. Not kidding. <laughs> no, the congressman's laughing. It happens all the time. Um, 
sometimes what gets reported on a blog will get picked up on a network and, and broadcast out. Um, there, I'm, I'm not going to name any networks here, um, but they're multiple. There's another network that has people on there that they um, cite as experts. In this case, it was a former Navy SEAL, and the guy had never been a SEAL. Yet he had been on for months and months talking about how important these missions were and how they operate. He was never, those things get kind of brushed under the carpet, right? So do you trust the media? And that's where we're all going to have a little love fest and like show of hands. I'm really interested to know how many of you, by a show of hands, feel like today you can trust the media. Don't be shy. There's one. If I can get there, two, three. Some media. OK. So that brings up a great point. You do. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So you bring up a great point, and that's where I wanted to bring the congressman in to kind of jumpstart us into the next round here. What is it for you, understanding that the media is very important in getting out your message, especially where you sit between the intelligence information and the public? What is important to you in knowing who you do and do not trust in media? Great. Well, this is a uh may not be the answer you want, but I'm very guarded. I don't trust any of them. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a bit cynical, but yeah. um, we've got this uh, struggle within the folks who sit on the committee. <clears throat> there could be things that are re widely reported in the media that are true that have just not yet been <coughs> officially outed. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, in fact, the previous chairman of the, of the Senate committee got in trouble for, in effect, confirming a classified operation of some sort because she made reference to it without the obligatory caveat, it's been reported in the public media, X, Y, and Z. And so yeah. I'm, I don't talk to anybody, quite <laughs> frankly. So. so I appreciate that. You, you set me up for, for a great response to that. And, and then I'd like to hear the responses of the panel. Um, not trusting anybody has, has problems as well. And Bill Harlow is probably the best person to launch us off on this. Because when you, as a reporter, when you get pieces of information, um, as we heard some of the prior panelists say today, you have a duty to report the information if you know that it's true, but you also know you might not have the full context. So what is the responsibility of the intelligence agencies to provide enough context so that they can come back later and hit you over the head and said you reported something you didn't know what you were talking about? <coughs> You're like, well, Bill, I came and asked you and you said no comment. Right, and I know it, it sounds odd, but as a former chief spokesman for a secret organization, I, I really did try not to say no comment uh, as much as I, I could. I, I'd find a way to say something. If a reporter came and asked a question, which I couldn't possibly answer, I would at least give them the rationale for why I couldn't answer it. I, you know, I understand why you're asking that question. It's a very logical question, but if I were to answer it, I'd be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. I know you don't want to do that. I don't want to do it either. Therefore, I can't answer it. But what I can tell you is, and then you tell them something that's related to it that will help inform their, their product. Uh, as the pressures increase, as the c competition increases, as there's more and more people who don't bother coming to a spokesman or come to a spokesman and they get disappointed, so then they quit going to them, then you get more and more stuff in the media that's just totally off the wall. In the IC, it's an added burden because when people get stuff wrong, sometimes you're not permitted to tell them that it's wrong. You're not allowed to correct it. You may be able to tell them, I can't tell you what the truth is, but that's not it. But that's deeply uh, unsatisfying to a reporter, and so it makes the, the job doubly hard. Um, but that's why it's important, in my view, for people in, in my old position to engage, to continue to try to work with reporters, to get to understand them, when you're trying to send a signal to a reporter that, that you know, th it would be a bad thing for you to report this or that this is wrong or you might be doing some damage, sometimes you can't explain to them why it is they'll be doing some damage, but if they work with you enough, if they've trusted you, if you've not led them down uh, the primrose path before, then they may listen to you. If you had no experience with them, maybe to shut them off, if you say this is all secret, you have no hope of, of affecting the outcome. So, um, Eric and John, it's, it's important for both of you. Source development, I know that you understand this better than anyone, is, is critical to being a good and responsible reporter. So when you're faced with people in very important positions or other people who you deal with as sources and they don't trust you, how do you overcome that? I think you, uh, you start by trying to go to people who do know them. 
and getting uh, people who can essentially refer you to them. If, they, if, this is, if, if walking in the front door, for instance, as a New York Times reporter doesn't do it, or they haven't worked with me before, uh, and this looks like it's going to be a tough nut to crack, I'm reaching out to somebody who I think does know this person and who that person also trusts, and somebody who can vouch for me, essentially. And oftentimes, um, I, I think Bill and, and John are right here, and we've talked about trust. You, you cannot overemphasize this, this sense. This is really a, the, the currency in which we work with. And oftentimes, this means building up trust over a long period of time. There have been very sensitive sources where you'll, I'll, I'll meet with the source initially. I won't take out a notebook. We're just having a conversation over coffee. It'll be completely off the record, uh, meaning I'm not going to use anything with it. But it's a setup for a further conversation, for yet another coffee, another meeting. So that person can size me up, I can size them up, we can size each other up, and we'll kind of see and agree, mutually agree on what the next step is from there. Uh, this process can take some time. And so as a, as a good reporter, you have to be patient. And I think, kind of getting back to one of your earlier points, Suzanne, we are now in an age where speed is really important to so many news organizations. How quickly can you get your news alert out? How quickly can you get a tweet up? The New York Times, as I think most major kind of ma news organizations, we prize ourselves on getting our news alerts out one or even two minutes ahead of the evil Washington Post or the <laughs> diabolical Wall Street Journal or even Politico. I mean, these are, this is what's kind of pushing us. Because the faster you get that news out accurately, the more clicks you're going to get. And that's going to drive your web traffic. It's going to drive your digital traffic which in many ways is really what's pushing us today. And we as journalists and my editors, we have to constantly be resisting that temptation to get a story out there too fast, because it'll be learned later be accurate, just so we can get a quick hit on the click level. And so this goes back to what, what are you willing to sacrifice in terms of accuracy versus trust in your sources? If you get a reputation as being a kind of a quick draw artist, getting something out there fast, without checking with multiple sources, without confirming it, without, as Bill said, com certainly coming back to a source in an aging like the agency such as this and getting some kind of steer, as we call it in the business, one way or another. Are you on the right track? Am I, you know, should I be, should I, you know, the warning light's going up on this one. And um, it's a balancing act. And hopefully you have enough sources who you've trusted long enough uh, who will give you that kind of guidance. Because uh, the last thing we want to be doing is, is have a story wrong and have to go in and correct it. Yeah, the New York Times is not big on that. John, um, you mentioned earlier that trust is kind of eroding and that it's more difficult to form relationships over time, like Eric talked about, is so important, and to have those meetings, and because people are constantly rotating through positions. Do you think that we are kind of past the point of no return? Has the, the age of sort of old time source development and investing and building relationships over? Uh, well, I hope not because of the implications that would have for our democracy. Uh, but I think Eric is right about speed, but I don't think speed's the only thing that's going wrong here. Uh, I think the erosion of the financial foundations of the traditional media has eaten away at our ability to do the right thing, as, as Eric described it. It's led to this need for speed, and frankly, I mean, at the risk of disagreeing a little bit with Eric, it doesn't matter if the story's right or wrong if you get it out first. You know, that's what takes precedence. And, you know, unfortunately, Mark Twain had this right, you know, 100 plus years ago when he said the lie is halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. Uh, and that's increasingly true today. Uh, and that's not to excuse the sometimes irresponsible behavior in the media, but to explain it. Secondly, I think the President made some very good points earlier this week when he talked about the balkanization of the media. And I'm not sure I agree that Reuters or the AP or even the New York Times can set the agenda anymore. What we've got is a kind of tribalization of media. Look, all of us are programmed in our social lives but also in our consumption of information to move toward those with whom we agree. So if I go, and this is part of what I teach at Georgetown, if I go to Fox News, I go in part because I'm going to like what I hear. And I'm not going to go looking for some opposite point of view. 
And so the temptation grows on the media side to take a consistent ideological position, to build a loyal following the way Fox News has, and never to diverge from that. That's not what journalism is. It's not a popularity contest. But this erosion of finance, as Eric referred to, has led some organizations to include in performance evaluations of reporters how many clicks their stories get. And that, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the, high, the low road to Kardashianville. <laughs> I mean, if I want more clicks and more pay, you know who I'm gonna write about. Uh, that's not quality journalism. But there are so many sources out there that are eager to pull the trigger. And the more sensational the story is, right or wrong, full or incomplete, the more attention it'll get, just because of pure sensationalism. So I think a lot of things are eating away at what Eric and I and others try to do, and it becomes harder to, to resist those things on which these relationships of trust are based. Uh, you know, we, we are essentially amateur case officers, and building trust with our sources is as difficult in many cases as it is for a case officer, I think. The other thing that I think has gone wrong has been the politicization of intelligence. Uh, this White House, in particular, has exerted a great deal of control over the IC's interaction with the press. And I don't think that's a healthy thing, because it introduces political objectives into what I think we've all agreed today is the need for the IC to produce unvarnished information rather than information tailored to what the policies of a particular administration tend to be. And so I think there's some fault on the government side as well at interfering with the independence of the intelligence community to put out information through the media that has nothing to do and may in some cases conflict with the political message that an administration is trying to put out. So I think there's some blame to be had on, on both sides. All right, so this is your opportunity. You must have like these burning questions about whether or not you can trust the media, how you know. Are we ever gonna get to a place where we do have trusted sources of information? Steve, why don't you launch in? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question uh, for John and Eric, following up on a comment that John just made. And tracking back to the lunchtime discussion we had with Lisa, where she described the administration's view of transparency and openness as a, as a necessary series of steps that will help rebuild trust with the American public and put our intelligence community on firmer grounding. And so it's easy to accept, you know, the declassification of uh, certain legal opinions and uh, the release of 25-year-old PDBs as you know, useful and interesting steps in that regard. But I wonder what you, what you feel like as a journalist when you get invited, for example, and this is truly random, to the ODNI. Uh, they say, we'd like you to come out tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. There'll be a few people available and they'll brief you on fill in the blank, blank maybe. You know, AQAP could be r rising threats in East Asia, could be North Korea proliferation. And there you are with six or seven of your colleagues, and you have this wonderful opportunity to sit in front of two or three of the, mo the smartest, best informed people in the US government who are reading classified information all day, and they're gonna talk to you about North Korea's missile program or something that's damn mm -hmm. interesting, and you're gonna write a story about it, and you're gonna refer to a <coughs> briefing you received the day before at the intelligence community. So you didn't pick that topic. You accepted an invitation to go out and hear about North Korea missiles. What if you understood that that was a briefing the administration asked the DNI to put on? Because guess what? They have a new initiative on North Korea coming out in a couple of days. They'd like to prepare the battle space for it. You're part of that. Yeah. And so that, how, do you, how do you feel about that process? That uh, happens frequently. And there's a little conference room, as you probably know, off the foyer of uh, the ODNI's office where those briefings take place. And my first question at those things frequently is, why is there somebody from the White House here? 
and I know the answer to that. My second question is, why did all your talking points have to be cleared at the White House? You know, which reinforces suspicion that this is a public relations move. But at the end of the day, I don't have a problem with sitting down with, you know, four or five analysts on something as obscure as Pyongyang's nuclear program or missile program. But those probably are not the only people I'm going to ask. And that's the one countermeasure, if you will, that we have in the media. Uh, I'm not simply going to, I'm not a stenographer. I'm a journalist. And there's a difference. And the difference, as Eric referred to earlier, is the second and the third source. Because like, like the congressman, I don't trust anybody either. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's the one kind of check and balance that we have. Uh, but sometimes those briefings are extremely useful because of the expertise that's available. So Bill, since we have you here, do uh, intelligence agencies hold those briefings to use journalists, or are they truly trying to answer questions journalists have already been asking? Not during my watch we did. not <laughs> Likely uh, answer, sir. Uh, <laughs> well, I think you know the, the creation of the DNI uh, has changed things a little bit. Back when I was there, the, the Central Intelligence Agency director was also the director of Central Intelligence. And, and we took no guidance from the White House on what briefings we could or couldn't give. Uh, we, we responded to pressure we get from reporters when they say, you know, tell us more about terrorism, tell us more about, about proliferation, about Iraq or whatever. There, there may have been times when the White House objected to what we were doing, or I would hear back that they didn't like what they read in the paper based on what they saw, but I never chopped a, a uh, talking point with the White House in my seven years at, at, at the agency. I understand anecdotally now that that does happen. And in fact, uh, when I was there, if we had uh, analysts briefing somebody, say, uh, on Cuba, I'd invite the top Cuba analysts in to sit down with top reporters, and they would just talk. And I'd be there to listen to learn so that I could tell other people you know, who didn't have the same access. But I never told them what to say. Now, as I understand it, they write out their talking points. They get their bosses to approve their talking points. There's a minder there, not just from the public affairs shop, but from their own shop, taking notes on what they have to sh say. If they go too far, that gets reported up the chain. As a result, no analyst wants to do a briefing anyway because it just adds to his or her burden too, too much work. That's part of the, of the slowing down of the information flow. Um, and I, I don't assign you know, terrible motives to it. I think it's, it's, it's people who are trying to be micromanagers and think they control information in ways which are just impossible to, to do in, a, in, a, in the real world and, and be very effective at it. And can lead to less transparency, not more, which is if you look at the full 360 picture of what transparency means, it's oh, yeah. not just, hey, we're going to be more forthcoming about what we want to be, but you're limiting the access of reporters to ask questions of independent people at different agencies, which is also affecting transparency. Congressman, question. Switch gears. I'm a CPA, and I, I practiced for 32 years, and my license is still current, just in case I lose that next election. Um, <laughs> but I lived under a code that held me accountable uh, for that purpose. If I screwed up a tax return, an audit, there were consequences. I don't see an accountability team for journalists, and I would think you would take enough pride in being using that word in its, its higher sense of journalists. We've blended journalism and entertainment today. You can't, just, you can't tell which is which. Uh, on most of the stuff. So why would, why would the journalist system uh, set something up to hold each other accountable and create some sort of a seal of good housekeeping, good housekeeping seal of approval that would allow readers and, 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 and information gatherers to see somebody held accountable for, for screwing something up or, and, and create a, a, a system that, set, that grades yourself in, uh, in that regard to, be, to help create that trust among users of the information. So I know it's an entertainer, I know it's an independent journalist or a journalist so that uh, I, can, I can gauge whether or not to trust them or not. I think that's an excellent question. Eric, why don't you answer it? Uh, so here's, here's what I say when that, that question comes up, Congressman. Um, again, we only 
can rely at the very end on the trust that we build with sources. So if we report something that's wrong or out of context. I'm, I'm talking about your user, building trust with your user because there's yeah. a proliferation of, of yeah. spots out there that are just flat out wrong. So how do you as a reader know how to know who to trust? Is that? Exactly. How does yeah. a reader? How do you help trust? Yeah. Okay. Everybody in here who's getting a zillion different inputs yeah. to okay. know which is the one that I can trust and which is the okay. one that I have to that, that, that is a hard yeah. one. And, and the first thing I say is, get that digital subscription to the New York Times. <laughs> but, no, but seriously, I mean, you have to, it's gonna be a little bit of trial and error. I mean, you're gonna have to go by, um, hopefully there are some, some websites, some news organizations, some outlets, whether they're traditional print mainstream. A formalized system that creates a code of conduct for journalists that you would agree to live by, and that when you show up, there's a, that there's a board or whatever that holds you accountable. Okay, well, this is what I thought you were getting at the first time. So if, again, if I, if I write something that's wrong and accurate out of context, guess what? You're not going to talk to me again, and you're going to tell everybody you know, don't talk to Schmidt. And oh, by the way, you might want not to talk to the New York Times. Well, my lifeblood is sources. If my sources dry up because of the credibility problem, and I'm down to a handful of basic spokesmen whose job is just to, to give me the basic information, I'm going to start getting beat competitively on stories. My bosses aren't going to like that, and I'm gonna get ultimately going to be out of a job. So no, do we have a, a, a formal board of conduct like that? I don't think, no, and I don't think we probably ever will, like a, you know, going to, you know, having a, 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 going to get your law, a law license or something like that. But there is, there is the, the kind of the world out there of, of, of sources, and the sources will dry up on you. They will stop returning your calls, they will stop meeting with you, and you will be out of, sure, you will be out of business. Right. There are a lot of folks out there who just make stuff up. Well, that's right, and, th and unfortunately this is where there's probably more pressure on consumers of news yeah. than ever before, of how do you yeah. sort out this kind of wheat from chaff, and there isn't a real good argument, because a lot of, going back to what John's talking about, is there may be some sources that many people will rely on that are ideologically in tune with their beliefs that may not be factually correct part of the time or any of the time. But they're not going to necessarily sign up to the same co code of conduct that somebody else on, say, the MSNBC side of the spectrum might be. So it, once you start kind of grading, trying to grade it that way, it becomes very tricky, I think, in this environment today. I, I would add one more thing uh, to your question, which is that when we do screw up, we have an obligation to admit it, to clarify it. Your paper did that after it got the Iraq story wrong series of stories about how Iraq had WMD, about how it tied, had ties to al-Qaeda. There was a very forthcoming, uh, transparent acknowledgement of what had gone wrong. Some of the Knight Ritter papers did the same thing because they published stories not, that were not the ones we wrote. They got them elsewhere. So I think it's very important for each of us individually to be accountable to our readers for what we do, and we do make mistakes. But I think too, too infrequently do we own up to them. And that er erodes the reader's trust in, it, in us the same way, as Eric said, it erodes our sources' trust in us. I'm also gonna like, do something probably pretty unpopular and push back and say there's a responsibility on the part of the person receiving the news to be a critical thinker. Right, You all, and we all as consumers of news, have an obligation to our own sense of whether or not something smells right, right? So people who are really, really intelligent in their day job, people who are related to me, I'll just throw my family under the bus as an example, really intelligent people who are critical thinkers, but if they hear something on the news, they just assume it's true. So I push back, I'm the worst person to have Thanksgiving dinner with, because I'll push back and I'll say, okay, let's, let's break down the statement that you heard, who was the source? Did the source have access to that information? And they all feel like, oh my God, just please serve the turkey quickly. But we have to kind of go through the process of knowing whether or not we're being critical thinkers when we're taking in this information. And I think that's something that's rarely ever talked about because we live in a society where nobody has time, right? Make my life easier. Don't put any burden on me to actually be critical about what you're telling me. It must be true. The onus is on you to make sure it's right. And I don't think we're gonna live in that society anymore. It's I think also that there, there, there's a, a role for government to play, and, which is reluctant to do it, which is when government sees a news report which is wrong, to, to come out and say it, not attack it in a Donald Trump-like way, but to just factually come out and say, you know, this guy who claims to be a Navy SEAL is not one. 
Um, you know, there was a guy on Fox News, uh, Wayne Simmons, who was recently arrested. He had been on for years claiming to be a former CIA officer. And there's a reluctance within the agency or anywhere else to, to say, wait a minute, let's check out that guy, you know, because of the nature of the agency. They, they don't check it out. And it seems to me that the government could do a service by spot checking some of the experts that are being quoted. And if, if they're not real or if their resumes aren't what they say they are, to point it out. Or if, they're, if, they, if they've inflated their resume, you know, the other guy who's on frequently who, you know, is, claims to be a, a former CIA officer. I know for a fact that he was there for four years in the mid-'80s and left at a grade several lower than my old secretary. And yet he's been dining out on there for years. Somebody needs to call out these people because your average reader, you know, they, or viewer, they see a guy on TV claiming to be a SEAL, claiming to be an intelligence officer, gives a, a compelling story. Usually the people who are good storytellers, you know. So the government could do a better job, I think, in pointing that out. If there's factual mistakes without getting in the face of the news organization saying the New York Times reported X, yeah, it was actually X plus seven or whatever, I think we could help the readers and help the the public in a way which we don't do now. And it's 4 o'clock, so um, in the interest of being invited back someday, um, I'm going to give Admiral Inman the last question, but I'm also going to call for sort of last call if there's anything burning that you really want to know. But then I'm also going to give you a couple things to think about, so homework, if you will, if you're interested in following up. Um, Elizabeth brought something up um, really interesting earlier where she talked about the widespread misunderstanding of 12333. Um, I think that's a fascinating conversation and, and trying to find in that un misunderstanding of what that actually allowed for and what was actually done, I think that's worth having a conversation with her. I'm sure we can just give everyone your email address, right, Elizabeth? <laughs> um, another, another thing to follow up on with Bill Harlow here is um, the Valerie Plame story. So if you want to talk about disclosures of information and how you can't actually verify something, you can try to steer a journalist, but then they may or may not listen to you, there's another good one there. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Admiral Inman, please fire away. I think the government gets in trouble when they start trying to steer the story. And the critical question is, does the story reveal sources and methods? Will it damage your ability to collect or get? If it doesn't, then what's the objection to the story in the process? And I have a long history where President Carter had enabled the ability to respond, and it was normally to editors, not to reporters mm -hmm. in the process. They were too low level. Yeah. And, and the question simply was, <clears throat> most stories can be told without, they may be embarrassing, but they're not damaging. Mm -hmm. If they tell how we know, mm -hmm. then it likely is very damaging to our ability continue. So to some degree, constraining back uh, the, the dialogue. And if, if there is some confidence at the news organization that they'll get an accurate answer reasonably quickly uh, in the process, and I say, that's where you begin to rebuild trust. Yeah. I agree completely with that. So with that note, I want to thank you very much for sticking around.